Hey there, I'm Mr. Terry and I'm a high school history teacher. Welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video. All right, the Paint Explainer put out another video that's relevant to what I talk about because it's called Every Type of Government Explained in 10 Minutes. So what I'm hoping to do here is maybe add a little bit of historical context or examples from history of the different governments that are going to be presented here. The original video will be linked down below. Make sure you support that. And like this video if you liked what we did here. All right, let's check it out. Okay, so I'm assuming, because he does, he goes really quick, I'll probably get some very safe textbook definitions of these um, of these governments. Uh, he does a pretty good job at that, so. All right, anyway, I'll try to um, add some examples and things. Darky. It's a political system where a small group of individuals are the rulers, usually indirectly through influencing the head of state, but sometimes even directly. People who believe in oligarchy usually think that it's an inescapable and natural structure, and they usually refer to the Pareto Principle, which, applied to productivity, says that 20% of the population will be responsible for 80% of the productivity. They also refer to Sturgeon's Law, which says that 90% of any selection will be of low quality, and to the Iron Law of Oligarchy, which says that every large organization will inevitably and eventually develop oligarchic tendencies, and that any attempt to get rid of them will only reinforce them. Confederation. I wonder where that philosophy is really going to come from though because if you're like a marxist you would say the exact opposite is what's going to happen there now again uh, oligarchy he basically just defined it as the rule of a few and that's that's way too vague that doesn't have any explanation uh, any 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 explanatory power because um there are a lot of governments that are like that so it was an aristocracy and stuff usually when you're referring to an oligarchy you're you're think you're talking about business leaders a small group of people usually from the business class all right, that influence um, government, have the power in government. So the first time you're probably going to hear about this in a history class is talking about Greek city states. Uh, so, for example, before, um, you know, uh, really the so so-called golden age of Athenian democracy, for example, um, which only lasted 50 years, by the way, they were an oligarchy. Um, Athens was a trading city. So Athens was uh, the most powerful people there were people that were in, in business because that's what they built upon, not on land, farmland and stuff like that. So an oligarchy, usually from the business class. So that would be a good example. But yeah, you, you that's usually what you want to do when you talk about oligarchy. Oligarchic tendencies and that any attempt to get the rid influence of them of business. will only reinforce them confederation. It's when a group of regional governments are united under a weak confederal government for some purpose where common action is needed, but they still have equal or more power than it. Confederal governments are usually created by a treaty to face critical issues such as defense from foreign enemies, economic problems, etc. The central government is required to provide support to all of its members, which are still sovereign states. Federation. Yeah, but yeah, but it's very weak. They're, they're basically like it is no central government really in a confederation. They each agree to some things, but there's not really an enforcing body with that. It's far more about like the the, the smaller state or whatever it is. Classic example, of course, is um, the United States before it was the United States. So between the American Revolution and the independence in 1781, for much of the uh, 1780s, the United States was a confederation. There was no national government. There were some things that each agreed to, but there was no enforcing body. So it's like very much like 99% of the powers in each of those states in the Confederacy rather than an individual government. I, I feel like he may have put a, a little bit more that there was a little bit more of a central ruling power. And I just don't think that's really the case. This combines a general central government yep. called federal with regional governments dividing the powers between the two. It See, I feel like already what he's saying is describes what he said a confederation was. Or sorry, yeah, confederation was what, what he's saying now of a federation. First from a confederation, since a federal government has much more power than a confederate one. Regional right. governments in a federation still have autonomy and the power to choose their own laws, but they cannot be entirely independent like in a confederation. The United States, Germany, Switzerland, Canada, etc. are examples of federations. Plutocracy. Yeah, it's like, it's not imperial, but it's like the stage below that where empires have different provinces and usually you'll see a, a confederate or a federation when a place is large and has a lot of diversity to it so these states have a lot of diversity there's just one unifying cultural aspect or something like that but it's also not like an empire so maybe somewhere with that all right plutocracy it's a society ruled or controlled by the rich and wealthy this see, one is not rooted in any established political philosophy but it's used as a pejorative to describe real world governments monarchy yeah it's not something that like anyone declares like we are a plutocracy it's just 
what it might look like. All right, monarchy, you probably don't need to talk about those. There's still plenty of these, but plutocracies, yeah. Um, going back to like modern oligarchies as examples too. Um, one place that's often considered an oligarchy is Russia, actually, where there's a handful, dozen or so of these incredibly wealthy billionaire um, uh, businessmen in Russia that got their wealth immediately basically with the fall of the Soviet Union. So under Gorbachev, when they started privatizing industries, since not a lot of people had a lot of capital, you know, there wasn't a lot of people to just go up and bid on, you know, these national industries like oil and it went into a small handful of people and their power honestly came from the government and the government gets their power from them. And it still happens with uh, Vladimir Putin with this, again, small handful of oligarchs, as they're called. In a monarchy, monarchy most common form of government monarch, history, and he's the head of state for life or until abdication. The monarch's power may vary from restricted and symbolic, like in a constitutional monarchy, where his powers are limited by a sure. set of rules written in a constitution. I don't think you guys need examples of this. Exclusive, like in an absolute look monarchy, where he's the only ruler. Sure. Most of the time, political power in monarchies is passed through inheritance, often right. building long dynasties. Republic. Sure. This term represents a state in which political power is given to the public Rome. through their representatives, in contrast to monarchy, where the power is centered and hereditary. Sure. To be defined as a republic, the representatives may or may not have been elected freely by the general citizenry. In fact, many historical and modern examples of republics choose representatives based on their personal status, with elections having a limited role. But they can have both. They can be both. You come from a certain status, and then it can also be elected, like in Roman Republic, where you had to be an aristocrat. You had to be a landowner, right, which was very hard. Not very many people own land. Um, so they came from the aristocratic class known as the patricians. So you can kind of have it both ways that way. But, yeah, republics. Um, it's not a direct democracy, okay, like you saw for a few years in, uh, say, uh, uh, Athens, right, if you were considered a citizen, that is, but you elect people to make laws and make decisions on your behalf. OK, it's seen as the expedient, efficient way to do democracies. Aristocracy. Aristocracy Landowners. translates from Greek to rule of the best. And it's a government system where political power is concentrated in a really small group of privileged persons called aristocrats. In ancient Greece, this term was used as a positive alternative to monarchy, where only the best of the citizens, selected through a careful process, could rule the rest of the population. The hereditary rule was abolished unless the ruler's child performed better or had better skills than the rest of society. Except aristocrats gain their power through hereditary processes. Some people call oligarchy the corrupted version of aristocracy, since the small group of rulers is not chosen through finding the best members of society, Neither but is an usually, hereditarily, often among wealthy families with big political power, authoritarianism. Okay, so aristocracies develop through land ownership, as did all power. All power, um, once once humans started to, to settle, right, domesticate land, power transferred to those who own land. Right. Who th that who those who own land are the power because land is what you need to survive. It's where you live. It's what you eat. And people became powerful through that. Right. Through land ownership and land ownership was then passed on through families. So you had these families that became very powerful over many generations. So aristocracies in a lot of ways you might consider, you know, like the early American Republic also like an aristocracy because you had to be a landowner to be able to vote in the early years. Authoritarianism is a form of government characterized by a strong and usually central power that demands obedience to authority and limited political and civil freedoms. For example, most classic monarchies are a form of authoritarianism. The sure. ruler of an authoritarian country imprisons, censors, and persecutes its opponents. Totalitarianism. Sure. So yeah, you're going to see that. You'll probably see a lot of things with totalitarianism. So authoritarianism, any absolute monarchy, I guess you would say, has that. So go along in the history there. Our totalitarianism. It's the extreme of authoritarianism, where all sociopolitical power is held by the dictator, who controls the national politics and the population's public and private spheres using massive propaganda campaigns through state-controlled mass media. It uses ideology to control the economy, arts, education, morality, culture, and private life. For this reason, it's usually governed by a charismatic dictator with a fixed worldview. Theocracy. Not necessarily. Totalitarianism can also just come from one party states. Look at the Soviet Union, for example. Um, under Stalin turned into total totalitarian state. Uh, a, a feature of totalitarianism, too, is the abolishment of competing political parties. So it's you got one party, right? So they have 
all the power there. And totalitarianism usually as well also makes the decisions, pretty much all the major decisions for a nation off of that. So it can be by a party, it can be by an individual. It's more about how it's ruled rather than who, than, than just an individual. All right, theocracy, religion rules. Chrissy. In a theocracy, the supreme ruling authorities are thought to be given divine guidance, acting as human intermediaries between God and the rest of the population. A very famous example of this is ancient Egypt, which was ruled by pharaohs who were thought by others to be associated with divinities like Horus and Osiris and acted as intermediaries. Technocracy. Sure, and of course, you didn't have to be uh, seen as a god to be a theocracy. It's basically just where your religious leaders are the same as your... Um, as your uh, Political leaders. I, I, in a way, you could say like the Byzantine Empire was like this. Someone like Justinian, who the emperor of Rome was also the head of religion as well. OK, so you had that uh, happening there. You could say in a lot of ways, something like Bourbon, or like like France, yeah, Bourbon, France, like, you know, go to like Louis the 14th or something like that, where, you know, they have a state religion it's Catholicism. Right. And had power over that. So maybe not fully a theocracy there, but like having state religion. But it is much more about having religious leaders be you know, the uh, um, political leaders, and, and Egypt's a perfect example of that. Technocracy supports a system of governance in which decision makers within an area are selected on the basis of their expertise in that given area, particularly with regard to scientific or technical knowledge, and supports the formation of a government of scientists, engineers, urban planners, etc. This do, you, do you think this is the future? Will there be a society that will truly embrace the most skilled and knowledgeable of the different different branches of how our economy and, and, and industries work? Um, do you think that will happen? This this sounds like something like like Plato would have been um, like a proponent of. He he wanted a uh, philosopher kings. He wanted the wisest people among us to be the decision makers. Do you think this is the future as technology becomes more and more powerful? That it's those technocrats that do that. Uh, I don't know if that means like hey, Elon Musk is now going to be on government councils or something. You know, this what I mean? term is also sometimes used to describe the idea of approaching social and economic problems through the scientific method, democracy. Democracy translates from Greek to rule of the people, and it's a system Democratory. where the general population of a state has political power. Its main characteristic is elections, where people can vote for laws in a direct democracy or for representatives who make laws for them in representative democracies. Democracy has a lot of variants, like parliamentary democracy, where the voters first choose the members who serve in a parliament, the legislative branch that creates laws. That's what a republic is, too. And then the elected members of said parliament choose who leads the executive branch, which has the purpose. Oh, of OK. So that's a little bit more indirect. Yeah. OK. Executing the laws. This I mean, used to be senators, you know, would, would vote for that. There's a lot of people that think that this should still be the case where um, leaders should be uh, selected, not directly by the people, but by um, legislative bodies. Chosen figure can keep its political power until the parliament removes its support. Presidential democracy, on the other hand, sees the president as the head of state and government, which does not derive its legitimacy keep adding, from like, parliament. Tags this type this of government no. relies on elections, and with at least 64 nations heading to the polls this year, Pew's latest survey comes at a vital time. While most people see representative democracy as a good way to govern their country, large shares of the public in many countries are open to non-democratic alternatives. I yeah, if, if, if you don't trust other people's votes and other people, yeah, your own your own people. You know what I mean? That that yeah, there's too much power given to people that have. I mean, this was Plato's concern. Plato's he was anti-democratic, and you know he said, "Why are we giving people essentially like voting power when there is no requirement that requirement for people to be even be educated on the matters that they vote for?" Feudalism. Feudalism was based on the exchange and property of land. Feudalism often results from a lack of. It, I feel like you look at it historically. It is a natural thing that evolves when there is no centralized government or when a centralized government fails, feudalism naturally happens. So I'll let him explain, then I'll give a take if I need to here. Where an overlord gave a piece of land to a vassal in exchange for some services or political military support. This is said to have created a pyramidal social structure where each step of the pyramid gave land to the yeah, lower many steps. Different places the king the and the world. church, who were at the top of the pyramid, usually had more land than anyone else while peasants, in exchange for protection, land to work on and a place to live in, provided the Lord with labor right. or a share of the livestock yielded from his lands. Sure. Demarchy. It okay. Yeah, feudalism. So the, the greatest examples with the fall of the Roman Empire, with no centralized authority, essentially in much of Europe, people relied on the people 
impacted their survival. Okay. There's certain things you need for survival. You need food, you need protection, right? So rather than having a large empire or something that can give you those or protect those things from long distances, you find somebody locally that can take care of you, right? And it's usually the person that can control land. However, he's able to control that because that gives you food to live off of. That gives you a job, those sort of things. And you don't need any kind of economy with it, really, like money or anything, because you literally just pledge your service and your service is your uh, your payment, I guess you would say, for that protection and the food and stuff that you get. And then in return, um, there's some kind of loyalty, right? There, You, you have to, as a, as a monarch or a lord or whatever you want to call it there, the owner, have to fulfill those promises, right? Otherwise, you're going to collapse. So it's a mutual um, obligation to each other. And we see this again in decentralized states. We saw it in Europe, um, you know, again, after, uh, after the... Uh, fall of the Roman Empire, uh, Japan for most of its history, okay, up until really Tokugawa and the other short times where there was like national, I guess you would say, unity in Japan. But then even in war-torn places like a modern Afghanistan or something, like you you get forms of that. I feel like it's a naturally occurring process in the void of centralization. It's the most used political system in ancient Athens, and it consists of randomly selecting public officials or rulers. People who support this system usually say that it frees candidates from the campaigning process and makes them prioritize making policy decisions so weird, in front though. of them. Kleptocracy. When you, think, when you think about it that way, just like randomly picking people. Well, in, in Greece, though, they would also uh, have an unpopularity contest. Uh, basically, every year they would vote out the person that they, they thought was the biggest threat to the state and you would get booted out and oftentimes it was like important people that that like ruled before um former great leaders and they would be like all right now that you're done let's let's get you out of here all right kleptocracy oh gosh see it's a term used to describe a government mainly composed of corrupt leaders who use their political powers to give themselves the wealth of the general population. Every government, It's lol. different from plutocracy and oligarchy, since the rulers enrich themselves secretly and outside the law through bribes, special favors, or directly sending state funds to themselves. Every government Kleptocrats ever. are sometimes left unpunished, and they often export most of their profits to foreign nations in anticipation of losing power. Anarchy. <laughs> I anarchy. was going to say, there's nothing more to say about that. All right, anarchy, no government. Because society has no rulers or authorities with a focus on freedom. Its main characteristic is the opposition of the state or other centralized government entities, which it considers to be This unjust. usually doesn't go well Anarchists for anyone. <laughs> usually advocate for the replacement of the state with stateless societies and voluntary free associations. Because in, an anar in, in an anarchical system, though, there's not protection, guarantees, anything like that. Uh, anarchies turn into feudal states. Corporatocracy. It's a system in which the state intervenes within the economy for the profit of a select number of corporations, especially by squashing their competition through laws, regulations, etc. A variant of this system Modern is called government lemon law. socialism, which is a pejorative term used to describe a government that offers money to of weak that. or lemon? bankrupt companies to save them and let them stay in the market. Socialist state. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it has to add to that. It's just, these aren't really like forms of government. It's just like how some governments act. If that makes it, you understand like the difference there. All right. Socialist state. Now, if the, your Marxist there, this is an oxymoron because uh, it's supposed to be uh, to the to the workers and not to the state. So we'll see. This what system comes about. from state socialism, which is an ideology that says that the working class needs to use state power and government policy to establish a socialist economic system where the workers collectively own the means of production. This type of state may. It's interesting because like when people hear like state socialism or something. Um, they might think of like national so socialism, like under the Nazi party, right? But the workers did not, uh, let me go back to this, uh, uh, control the means of production with that. The state did, right? Um, so it's, it is, uh, it is like oxymoronic almost to, to, to call you, uh, something to, to call it something like that. But then you'd also have, uh, you know, something like like Joseph Stalin believed in communism in one country. Got to got rid of the the, of the the idea of trying to unify, you know, like like universally based off of the working class of, of the planet, but more based on the people of the state. You know what I mean? So like 
This has meant so many different things to so many different people in so many different places. Socialist economic system where the workers collectively own the means of production. <laughs> this type of state- And of course, like that didn't happen in like national socialism, Nazis, right? Sure. Um, that didn't happen. There was still private ownership of all of that. In fact, labor unions, which would be the closest thing to that were, you know, abolished it may vary from a system where the means of production distribution and exchange are nationalized or under state ownership to simply one where social values or workers interests have a priority sometimes they're seen as the socialists like state socialism is a transitionary thing which is the transition from taking things from private ownership and it's the mediary to eventually moving that towards ownership by the people and the workers Right. A lot of states have have said that that is their goal, you know, something like a China or Soviet Union or something like that. Um, but that, that, that full transfer to the actual working class, it doesn't happen in a lot of those cases. Right. Communist state, communist states. See, now this is an oxymoron. This is a straight up oxymoron. Communism requires a moneyless, stateless, uh, yeah, moneyless, okay, classless, stateless society. It's a goal that you hope to achieve one day. When everything has been completely shifted to the workers, there's now no longer need for a state. There's now no, no uh, yeah, uh, uh, there's no classes anymore, no money, stuff like that. So uh, in a lot of ways, this is oxymoronic. Usually have the official aim of achieving socialism and progressing towards a communist achieving, society. Achieving they are usually communism. a one-party state socialism and administered is a way through democratic communism. centralism, which says that once a decision wins through democratic voting, it must not be further debated and everyone needs to follow it, forbidding any further discussion and criticism that may disrupt Dictatorship of the proletariat. the action. The goal of this method is to speed up the decision-making process and to avoid decisions being undermined by participants whose views this are This is an interesting minority. take on it, though. Geneocracy. I haven't heard of that specific Tate as the defining feature of a communist state. I have to look into that. Geneocracy. Okay, I've never heard of this. Geneocracy advocates for a minimal criterion of intelligence for political candidates and voters. Most of the time, geneocracy's main criticism of current democracy is that politicians become more concerned with appealing to the masses through emotional appeal and instead of making long-term critical decisions and that political mandates are too important to be given just through popularity. This is this is what Plato warned about democracies, that we're not going to be electing people based off of skill. We're going to be uh, just electing people that tell us what we want to hear. <laughs> Noocracy. It's a government system where authority is only given to the most knowledgeable and wise people, <laughs> traditionally being philosophers okay. and theologians. Yeah, this is, this is pl literally Plato, philosopher kings. The people that rule over us should only be uh, the they should be the wisest among us. Shout out to these guys who support my channel through Patreon. Awesome. Love my patrons. Love my patrons, too, and channel members. All right. Final thoughts. All right. As compared to a lot of these explainer videos by the paint uh, explainer, I feel like I had to interject way more than I have before. But hopefully you're able to get kind of what the the um, interpretation of these forms of government from a history education perspective and a social studies, you know, as a teacher and, and, and how, how it's communicated and how the consensus of from educators has concluded about what these terms are and what these terms mean. Hopefully you were able to get that. And that's kind of, I, I would say what I bring here. Now you can sit there and philosophize about all these, these different theologies and or, or, or beliefs and, and, and all that. But like, that's what I gave you guys. Okay, is what us as educators are probably you're you're probably likely to, to you know to hear in an educational setting. So hopefully that gave you that uh, gave you a little bit more knowledge on it. Because again, some of this stuff can have different meanings and different interpretations. And getting as many interpretations, obviously, of philosophy that you can is always going to be better. All right, and with that, we'll see y'all next time.